Professor Daniel Van Lel, Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics. Professor Nicholas Ngepa, our inductee for this evening. Professor Mari Lebrandt, Professor of Economics at the University of Cape Town and Director of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit, who is our respondent today and joining us remotely. Senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, our online audience joining us via Facebook and YouTube, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sanbonani, Huyanand, good evening, Tobela. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Nicholas Ngepa. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to his loved ones, special guests and colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Nicholas, and of course for us here at UJ, higher education, South Africa, and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor functionary and deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it's an expression of welcome and an entry of new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Traditionally, in Isikosa, we say, Ukutweswa Isitanga Kusikaba Sobunjingalwaz. This loosely translated refers to assuming the role of the professor. Of course, in colonial traditions subscribed to by universities, this refers to the gown and the cap. The wise one would accept a blanket in Gubo in Isikosa. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown or ingubo denoting the professorship will be formally assumed. We gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Ngepa to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. It's a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide a university with its identity, character, academic legitimacy and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of a person as a professor. This evening we will listen to Professor Ngepa as the gown goes to town. By this I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates with society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt referred to the university as a whole community of scholars and students engaged in the common search of truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instrumentalist serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward Said, in an article on defiance and taking positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual. As I open quotes, one who commands vast knowledge of the person's discipline, who is rigorous in analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation. The intellectual who considers it's necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it to step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing proce process or 
contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden and to provide alternatives to mistaken policies, close quote. It remains then for, the, for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers of our discipline? This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we will listen to Professor Ngepa as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once the lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with the promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite Executive Dean Professor Daniel Van Lel to introduce Professor Ngepa. I thank you, Geleboha, Diabonga, Bye, thank you. Vice Chancellor Functionary, fellow scholars, all the, our dear guests who are watching us from afar, and a special warm welcome here tonight to the Ngepa family. And tonight I'd like to acknowledge his beloved wife, Ruth. Ruth, I spoke to you over the phone when I called Nicholas to congratulate him on his promotion to a full professor. Tonight I have the privilege to meet you and your sons, Ariel and Ethan, in person. Thank you for you and the entire family for your contribution to our wonderful colleague. It is my absolute pleasure tonight to introduce Professor Niklas Ngepa. And he's a dynamic scholar and leader within the College of Business and Economics, more specifically within the School of Economics. His research addresses poverty, inequality, and inclusive economic growth and the underlying areas of trade, industrial health, energy, agricultural, and environmental policies. Now, he was born in Baligashu, a small village in Anglophone Cameroon. To uneducated parents, his upbringing was collective, as it often happened in African communities involving non-family mem members. And a good part of his nurturing was done by his church. In his early years of elementary schooling, he became interested in pure sciences. And I've heard some interesting stories about how he has procured a car battery in attempting to understand how electricity is generated. Having completed his schooling majoring in science subjects, he went on to study physics and chemistry at the University of Johande I. He quickly realized that the scientific mind should be applied as much to the challenges of dual and unequal linguistics, cultural and colonial heritages, including poverty. He then obtained an honors degree in economics. However, he developed a passion to work for God. It was from the pastoral field that his university called him to accept a merit postgraduate scholarship for top performing Francophone students to complete their master's degrees at different African, uh, African universities. So here his career started by being an undergrad tutor. And his lecturers soon realized his talent and took a keen interest in his English-French bilingualism and involved him in translating their notes and research proposals from French to English. Now here's where the real scholar comes in. Soon, Nicholas wrote his own proposal, eventually funded by the African Economic Research Consortium. And then he realized that to have real academic and public impact, he had to climb the academic ladder. He enrolled at UCT and completed his PhD in 2010 on the nexus of energy, inequality, and pro-poor development. 
supervised by Prof. Murray Labrand and Dr. Gisela Prasad. In 2011, Prof. Ngepa became involved at UJ as a visiting senior fellow. And uh, it looks to me as though the courtship worked well. And in 2016, he was appointed as an associate professor. And by 2020, he was promoted to a full professor. And that takes some doing. Prof. Ngepa has worked for several public sector organizations. For example, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, researching the socioeconomic impact of energy sources and particularly biofuels. He worked at the SA Competition Commission as a senior economic expert, leading investigations of mergers and firms' anti-competitive behaviours. Also as Oxfam, Great Britain's regional head, research for Southern Africa. Since 2018, he has researched defence spending and development, and now focused more on how the fourth industrial revolution will shape labour, inequality and poverty. He publishes widely and deeply, indeed realizing his ideal to be impactful. He collaborates locally, continentally and globally. For example, with organizations such as the World Bank, the African Research Consortium, to name but two. His research attracts policymakers' interests glo globally, as shown by 14 technical and policy reports over the last eight years. Again, together with the World Bank, African Capacity Building Foundation, and quite a number of African governments. He served on the African Development Bank's panel of experts on inclusive growth and had deep impact on the Namibian government's efforts towards wealth redistribution and poverty eradication. Through the British Overseas Development Institute and Southern Voices, he developed and presented a policy set for the first thousand days of the SDGs in Africa on economic growth, inequality, gender equality and poverty. His policy presentation to a high level of African ministers and stakeholders, facilitated by the African Economic Research Consortium in 2019, is the basis of his inaugural lecture tonight. And he has told me that God blessed him with a virtuous wife, as I've mentioned before, Ruth Ngepa and two vibrant boys, Ariel and Ethan Ngepa. And Nicholas continues to work for God as a lead pastor at the Holy Covenant Mission Church in Pretoria. It is an absolute pleasure to present to you Professor Nicholas Ngepa. Thanks, Professor Van Dele, for this introduction, and uh, thanks everyone. I'm usually not a very formal person, so formality is a bit strange to me, but I'm going to try my best uh, to do as others usually do when they're in this kind of situation. Um, the first thing I want to start is to recognize the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, Professor uh, Chlidzi Marwala and the VC functionaries present and uh, those who are watching online and the executive team of the university in general. I've collaborated with so many beautiful people within this university and I love them all. I also want to recognize and deeply appreciate uh, Professor Daniel Van Lee, who is my dean in the College of Business and Economics. I've worked with him so cordially and I still love to work with him. When his term is over, I would like to vote him again for another term. I want to also uh, particularly uh, recognize uh, Professor Hados Van Seel, who is the HOD of the School of Economics. Uh, that is the most wonderful, gentle, elderly man that I've worked with in life. He's so fatherly, and uh, I, found, I find it very easy in the School of Economics leadership team. 
if you see the school of economic moving forward is because of his tenacity and i'm deeply grateful for that team of leadership with whom i work at the school of economics and i also wish to recognize so particularly professor mary Lebrand. he supervised my phd he's another fatherly figure when i came to south africa for the first time i landed in his hands and he took me as a son and uh, I did PhD he supervised me so well and since then he had followed up to check how I'm doing which is quite strange uh, that someone will follow up that was since 2010 till now he still follows up on me and uh, I also want to thank him when I finished my PhD he insisted that I remain at the University of Cape Town and I disobeyed him and refused and I found myself here at UJ I can't explain why I also want to recognize uh, Professor Gisela Prasad, who co-supervised co my PhD with Professor Mary Lebron. And uh, I would like to recognize a very dear friend, uh, Dr. Ayodele Odushola, the uh, UN resident representative in South Africa, uh, who is watching online. I've worked with him quite well, for quite closely for some time. I also like to acknowledge friends in uh, the uh, with World Bank, there are a number of them might be watching online or they might watch later, African Development Bank and African Capacity Building Foundation, and a number of other organizations. And I want to particularly recognize the African Economic Research Consortium because my research skills, uh, they are the ones who sharpen it when they first funded my research proposal as uh, was read to you. And later on, uh, continuing that network, from 2004 on to now, I was first of all groomed by them and I became an expert and I'm still serving them a lot and I thank them for the work that they have done. i like to recognize my mother, uh, Victorine Zinger. Uh, my father is of late, but she had really labored a lot and my elder brother and my other siblings as well. And a brother in church, a brother Joseph Kobe, he did a wonderful thing in my life and and many other people pushed me as it was right that I was brought up by a vast group of people, uh, not just my parents. I also want to recognize Pastor Emmanuel Mba in Cameroon and Dr. Wana Bennett. And I also would like to recognize a number of other friends. Now, um, God is very merciful in that uh, he knows the helplessness of man and uh, he had to create a woman. And, uh, he created a particular woman for me, that is Ruth Ngepa. And uh, women have a way of making you civilized, if I could be a very brutal professor. But uh, thanks to a woman, I know my left from my right, and I thank God particularly for that. And uh, I've, she has also helped me to be so productive and so reproductive as well. Evidence is the two boys that we have up there and I don't know if others will come. I also want to say this very clearly that uh, um, she, uh, she studied here at UJ and then uh, at the, when she was to do a master's, she ran away and went to University of Pretoria because she didn't want to be taught by her husband, so she left. And that is fine. Uh, uh, Professor Daniel Van Lee says that she recognizes conflict of interest. I saw it otherwise, so it's okay. And I want to thank God Almighty, um, God who is able to put wisdom in foolish minds. I'm so grateful for God who makes us to be able to think and to question things and do research and come up with ideas. And uh, to all others that I might have forgotten, I just want to say all protocols observe. And um, I'm going to the lecture tonight. I thought that um, this is an occasion where people honor uh, promotion and uh, I thought, um, I rather thought that it shouldn't be much about me, but that we should take the time to reflect on. A key problem in our society that has grown to global scale, which is inequality, uh, because uh, we do not really think that uh, we underestimate the damage that it causes and the potential that it will cause even more damage in the future. That is why I've titled this lecture, Socioeconomic Exclusions and State Failure, a Prospect Theoretical Perspective. 
I took interest in this topic, and if you look around, you look at the pandemic that we are still in, and we are hopeful to get out of it, and I don't know when. Uh, you look at the way states acted, you then understand the importance of um, a capable state, a legitimate state, and a well-functioning state in being able to take care of a citizen during times of shock. Uh, you would realize that uh, most states had struggled to put their citizens in order during this period and take care of them. I published a paper early 2021 in January in the British Journal of uh, Health uh, Policy and Planning uh, where I looked at uh, the socioeconomic uh, determinants of this COVID-19 mortality and what uh, the world can learn for future pandemics. And uh, in that paper, I strangely found that um, the efforts of government had uh, worsened the situation of mortality. Then there's another paper coming out uh, in, in the next two months in African Development Review, where I was looking at the spread of the disease in, in Africa itself. And the same finding is still there that uh, the, the government efforts did not help the situation. And the question is why? I don't think it's all government that failed to, to do well in this. But I realize, and there's much work to be done there, which I'm still reflecting on to do more around it, that socioeconomic exclusion was one of the key reasons why government effort could not yield fruits. Because during the period of lockdown, what pushed people not to obey uh, the, the stringent measures were uh, uh, problems of poverty, inequality, and lack of uh, protected livelihoods. And uh, that showed its effect and the era in which we are entering, the era of pandemics and the era of shocks will prove to be even more difficult if we don't have stable states. So this is where the inspiration for this work came, but particularly uh, in addition to so many other uh, research that I've published on that I thought that I should focus now on the eels of exclusion and how it threatens the very existence of the state in which we, we live. Uh, in 2018, uh, uh, November 2018, the African Economic Research Consortium asked me to prepare policy. And the title of the policy was how to reverse fra fragility through inclusive growth. I prepared that and in 2019, uh, March 2019, uh, uh, African ministers gathered in Harare and uh, I presented that policy to them and we debated about it. But when I left there, I realized I could do more because at that time I realized certain gaps in this topic. And that is where I came up with uh, the topic that I'm presenting now. And secondly, uh, my work with uh, one of my PhD students and yet another is uh, led me to look at um, the effect of military spending on development. Then I realized that um, the issue of security and the nexus of state stability is so important, and I then crafted the role that um, exclusivity would play, socioeconomic exclusivity. So then I came up with this topic. I prepared a paper, particularly for this event, which after that I would uh, then send for publication, but it's based on previous policy work that I've done for African governments. Um, the first thing I want to start with is the bedrock of modern economics. You see, um, the, the father of modern economics is God, Adam Smith. Just like all of you have grandfathers, so too uh, economics has a grandfather as well. And he put up a theory that is very difficult to challenge, although we see its weaknesses. But because it's the grandfather who put it there, we can't really challenge it. But it's time we start to think about the culture of economics and the outcome of the processes of economics in the modern world to see whether we will indeed disobey our grandfather in economics, Adam Smith. He put up that um, the, every uh, human being is self-seeking, so they maximize their personal utility. And in the process of maximization of that personal utility, there is an invisible hand that ensures that the good of all is assured. Yes, I don't have a problem with the first tenet of this proposal, which is maximization of personal uh, utility, because that speaks to the greed of human beings. This is the root cause of what we observe. 
And that is true. So the economics did not make the man. Economics tried to explain human behavior. But to say that there's an invisible hand that is going to fix everything is where the trouble is because the invisible hand is an ideal hand that is either amputated or is paralyzed because it's not working. Then states have come in with policies to try to fix it, to help the invisible hand, and they are not also succeeding. Therefore, we have to start to think very carefully about the role of the invisible hand and what state should play. And why is the invisible hand not working? Because markets are not functioning as he dreamt about. And markets have hardly functioned as he dreamt about. And that is the reason why we find prosperity with a lot of exclusions in a modern world. And the World Bank is beginning to talk about shared prosperity precisely because they've realized that the prosperity that is being witnessed is not shared. I will show you a few um, uh, points that the prosperity that we talk about in the modern world is a prosperity for a very few. One to 10% of the global population are the ones in germ prosperity. But the masses are in poverty, they're in exclusion. And this is a big problem. Why is it a big problem? Because uh, since 1946, uh, we have seen steady decline in global wars. But what we've seen rising are conflicts, and those conflicts are usually within countries, and they're becoming more serious. I have a few uh, uh, numbers here. Uh, uh, in uh, 2017, half a million people were killed in internal homicides within countries. But only 89,000 people were killed in act active armed com conflicts, and 19,000 in the terrorist attacks. So you compare what the, the uh, mortality due to internal conflicts versus wars, you realize that something is happening, but because it's not happening like the First World War, the Second World War, it is very difficult to call attention to it. It's happening within national boundaries. And we take the pretext of sovereign states to not to call attention to what is happening in so many developing countries. But what still is spilling over to developed countries. For the first time in America, we saw American democracy in jeopardy during the time of the election, the election of Joe Biden, when uh, Trump had to give power, uh, transit, transit to uh, Joe Biden. And what happened is there's some ideological issues involved, but primarily is an issue of inequality. The question of black life matter. When we come to South Africa, what we're witnessing in South Africa is the direct evidence of inequality and social exclusion. And we cannot ignore that. Um, sorry, I've not been moving my slides. I've just been talking and going, so I'm just take, going to take the, the audience to the page where I, sh I should find myself. Uh, I'm taking you to the graph that I put up uh, using data from World Inequality uh, 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 database. Uh, that graph, the top graph in red, shows the share of wealth that goes to the top 1% of global population. The bottom graph, which is around 5%, the top one you can see is uh, close to 20%. What it says is that the top 1% of global population appropriates for itself more than about 20% of the wealth of the world. And the bottom 40%, uh, they only get about 5% or a little bit more than 5%. That's a picture, and that picture has not changed for a long time, as you see, is steady. So when you find a world like this, you ask yourself, where is it heading to? Uh, this is a picture of exclusion. Then we have uh, new interest in inequality. Previously, from the 1960s, uh, 1976 particularly, when uh, a certain uh, uh, eminent uh, scholar by the name of Aluwala, he published an article on um, uh, the, the inequality, uh, starting first with the Kuznets hypothesis. And so there was so much... Um, the uh, interest in um, the causes of inequality from that period until uh, the late 90s and 2000, people were more interested in what causes 
inequality. And so they explain inequality by the development process. And so it was explained, actually explained away because the explanation is that as nations develop over time, inequality is going to go away when everybody leaves the, the, the rudimentary sector and joins the developing sector, then inequality will start to reduce again. But that explanation has not stood. Once we began to, to witness the effect of inequality itself, that inequality uh, inhibits development, inequality slows down economic growth, and inequality slows down the ability of economic growth to reduce poverty, and inequality itself has many other social ills in society, people began to look at the effect of inequality on development itself. And this is the, the, the current thinking on e economic, uh, in economics of inequality, which is uh, how inequality affects development. And it is in this respect also that I'm stepping in and my, my uh, line of thinking had been in this area for a long time. I focused a lot on absolute poverty, then inequality and inclusive growth. And uh, now I'm looking at the role that current inequality is playing in the states that we have. Uh, we might, if we don't do something about inequality, we might just soon forget about the state as we know it because it will be ineffective, incapacitated, and delegitimized. Delegitimized means that uh, citizens will not more believe in the state and therefore they wouldn't take what the state is doing seriously. So I'm going to start by defining what a state is and uh, the situations of fragility, how I measured it before I go ahead to look at the effect on, of uh, exclusion on the state and how states ultimately fail because of exclusion. I uh, begin with the Weber's definition in 1978 uh, where he defines in, uh, st the state as a compulsory political association that successfully upholds a claim to the monopoly of legitimate use of physical force in the enforcement of um, its order within a given territory. Uh, that is the definition of state, and that is the ideal definition of what a state should look like. But from this ideal definition, you can measure certain deviations from this definition, and certain attempts that have been made to generate indicators of state fragility or state failure have been made in relation to some ideals and generating certain deviations and then uh, associating scores to them that we then use to do analysis. So um, that definition given, uh, it has two key associated dimensions. There is the effectiveness and there is the legitimacy. State effectiveness has to do with the capacity for a state to translate uh, policies into action. In, you've heard a lot that in many countries, the, particularly South Africa, they tell you that we don't lack policies, we have good policies. What we lack is implementation. Part of the implementation is the capacity to implement. And that capacity speaks to that, the state. That state, has it got that capacity? The second aspect, and by the way, the capacity is underpinned by the ability to mobilize the resources and to use the resources effectively to serve the citizens. The second aspect of the state is legitimacy. Legitimacy is uh, how citizens accept the state. For example, when students are marching, if the police will go out and tell the student to go back and sit down and wait for the state to do something, if the students believe in the state, they're going to obey. They're going to say that the state has promised that something will be done, and they'll stop marching immediately and go back and wait for what the state will do. But when they, they, if the state is not legitimate in the eyes of the citizens, what the state puts out will not be believed. And it in, in itself is a problem because that affects the capacity to implement policy. So how do we then define state failure from this dimension that I've explained? State failure then once you have this ideal and deviations of this, from this ideal is state fragility. And state fragility can range from zero for no fragility and infinity for the highest fragility. And uh, uh, indicators that exist uh, uh, measure state fragility up to 25 uh, point scores. Uh, how do we define state failure? State failure then occurs at the extreme uh, uh, right end of fragility. 
and usually the OECD would take the top uh, two quintiles. When a country belongs to the top two quintiles, then they will define that state as a failed state or nearly failed state, or a state that is failing. I would prefer the state that is failing. So, um, failed state has a number of um, characteristics uh, which I would rather skip, but it, one of it is the inability to mobilize resources, the inability to claim monopoly over the legitimate use of force on the citizens, which is actually control, law and order, and uh, the inability to provide public goods and command legitimacy. Now, the indicators that I have used to do this analysis, uh, there are a number of um, uh, data sets that one could use. Uh, there are, uh, in general, three. There's a World Bank's country policy and institutional assessment, which is quite um, uh, encompassing, but and there's also the phase state index. But the challenge with them is that their span is so limited that you cannot use to do long-term analysis. So I prefer to use the State Fragility Index of Center for Systemic Peace, which I've used in this work. And I've, this is, that um, uh, uh, table there is um, the distribution of countries. You will not be able to easily see those countries, but the red countries are African countries. If you look at African countries, I've actually, uh, uh, th that table, I've organized countries by quintiles. So the top quintiles are states that are failing or close to failing or states that are stressed, let me use that word, in situations of fragility. If majority of the African countries are in the last two quintiles, uh, top two quintiles. This is concerning. And I'm going to show you that it is not for nothing. It's inequality and exclusion is behind what you're seeing, although state failure also perpetuates inequality, but in, uh, exclusion or, uh, plays much more role. Uh, the point, what we are looking at there uh, is quite worrisome that uh, most African countries, it's, there's only one African country that I found in the bottom quinta. That was Botswana. I don't know if there's any other country there. But most of the African countries are at the top. South Africa is in quinta three. When we go further, that messy graph there, the left hand is showing poverty reduction. You see, um, the Millennium Development Goals, were, uh, one of the key goals, uh, objective of the Millennium Development Goals was to have poverty from its 1995 levels, 1990 levels by 2015. So around 2015, the assessment of the Millennium Development Goals were undertaken, and uh, a number of countries actually met those objectives of having poverty, but Sub-Saharan Africa particularly hardly made it. So you see the, the graph, the, the topmost graph is Sub-Saharan Africa. Poverty has reduced uh, so marginally compared to other regions of the world, I've divided into regions of the world. At the same time, if you look at the right hand side of the graph, that is the share of the top 1% to bottom 50%. So that graph is, is telling you how many times the top 1% in any region gets uh, relative to the bottom 50%. And if you look at um, Middle Africa, that top of most graph is Middle Africa. And Middle Africa includes a good part of the Great Lakes region. And when you find that region so unstable, a good part of what is happening there has to do with exclusion as well, absolute exclusion. So the top 1% uh, gets as much as 4.5 times relative to the bottom 50%, whereas uh, the other regions are that low. That tells you that something is really wrong in Africa in terms of uh, uh, exclusion. And with this picture, we shouldn't be celebrating millionaires in Africa. When people are counting dollar millionaires in Africa, I don't see that as something that we should be clapping hands for because it is uh, 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 flacking something uh, very serious. 
Now, when I, let me take, go back to academics in uh, modeling fragility in literature. I found um, the key gap that I find is that there is no formal framework proposed. And uh, the analysis that have been done have been done without certain logical approach because there's no formal framework. So in this work also I propose a framework of analysis of the economic exclusion fragility relationship. Uh, we have uh, some modeling of uh, fragility uh, in uh, existing literature. The first uses intuition and descriptive analysis and they borrow from previous literature and they have no formal statistical or econometric approach. And they come up with certain indicators that would be associated with fragility. For example, employment, job creation, infrastructure development, foreign direct investment, trade openness, and reliance on natural resources. Then you have another group of uh, scholars who look at um, fragility in econometric terms, but they still do not have a formal framework they do correlation analysis and choose variables that will enter the framework. And they, they, they come up with variables like, um, um, like economic growth, income levels, democracy, trade, openness, human rights, empowerment, and so on. Now from this, uh, anal uh, this uh, uh, short literature review, I noticed that level of income and income growth is the key that is consistent in all the papers that I've analyzed. And I realized that actually the failure of a state could be more explained because if you think of the state re resilience as the efforts of the citizen to put the state together in terms of contributing to revenue mobilization so that the state is incapacitated and also in terms of legitimacy, believing in the state so that the state has the power to do its work. If you think in that sense, you will come to realize that the whole state failure will be explained, not by external forces, but by internal dynamics. There are few cases in the world where external forces have affected the functioning of the state. But most states in Africa are failing. We might blame colonialism, but I think that a good part of the role that is to be played is by the citizens themselves and the governments and not external forces. Because the dynamics within is what determines whether the state stands or it fails. So what is the process of state failure then? The first is level of satisfaction. During the Arab Spring, we noticed a number of papers have proven that, that it was particularly satisfaction and of the youth's dissatisfaction that caused them to go to the streets and demand that the government change and something happened. And what we notice is that when new governments come to power, given time, they will, some, it will start to fail again and so something has to be done. If the exclusions are not corrected, it will be a cycle and a cycle is a vicious cycle. So um, I then propose that the process of building a state is the level of satisfaction of the citizen and the distribution of that satisfaction. If some people are more satisfied than others, then those who are less satisfied will not have the incentive to build. Now this is where prospect theory comes in. I started by talking about the traditional economics where they, they think of uh, um, uh, uh, expected utility theory as explaining human behavior better. But um, in 1979, uh, Kahneman and Tversky came up with this experiment that they did and they proposed that they, they said human behavior is not really modeled as much as we have, economists have been modeling human behavior. Human beings uh, are more, uh, they, 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 they associate more weight to losses than gains. That is, if I give you 10 run, you are very happy that I gave you 10 run. But if I take the same 10 run from you, you are going to be not very happy, but ve not very sad, but very, very sad that I've taken the 10 run back from you. Which means that your utility of 10 run is less than your disutility of minus 10 run. And because of that, somebody who feels excluded 
has a greater power to destroy than somebody who gains. And this is where, the, this is where I'm trying to apply this theory to the dynamics of state failure, where a small group of marginalized people in a society can actually bring the whole state to its knees. Because we always think, all right, there are rich people in South Africa. They should stand up and do something. But the disutility of the poor people is so much so that they are more powerful to destroy. They have more passion for destruction than the utility of those who have the wealth. And this is the reason why we see things going downhill, in my view, and from this theory that I put forward. So I'm not going to bother you with the mathematics. Uh, so I, my aim is not to present that. But the paper has the, the framework that I've put forward because I've aggregated this individual thinking and individual disutility of exclusion into some aggregate number that, uh, that gives me the level of utility and the distribution of utility. Level of utility, you can proxy it by per capita income of the uh, population. But that is not the most important. It's not mo so much the level of economic growth or the level of GDP that matters. It is how that GDP is distributed that matters even more. And that is what the model tells me when I apply it in modeling with data. So um, in terms of uh, economic exclusion, so, so economic exclusions, I have various dimensions. I'm going to spend a little bit of time to talk about what dimensions of socioeconomic exclusions I included. The first is human capital exclusion, particularly education. That became so important. And uh, in uh, uh, 2016, when I was giving input to the uh, policies for SDGs, I was doing research and I included um, education as well in the analysis. Uh, in the early days, the World Bank had been uh, calling for investment in basic education. And we talk about investment in basic education, rightly so, because it is the foundation. But, and this is something that I'm doing with one of my students, I want to look at the optimal level of education for, to take people out of poverty in South Africa. What level of education should be required? And is that level shifting over time? Uh, this... At this time, we shouldn't be talking about basic education because basic education will give you literacy, but it gives you nothing more than literacy. Why? Because if you look at the inequality that we're observing today, is skis premium that is the biggest contributor to inequality. Which inequality in South Africa accounts for more than 60% of overall inequality in South Africa? That tells you that inequality happens more in the labor market, and that is because of skills. So when we think in terms of basic education, we have to think again, because right now, and some studies that I'm seeing, including my own, indicates that we have to take education beyond basic in order to reduce inequality and take people out of poverty. We have to give them at least secondary to tertiary education for us to begin to reduce that. We'll discuss a little bit more, and I hope that you give me, uh, allow me to talk a little bit, but we discuss once I, uh, I show you the results. So I looked at educational exclusion and health exclusion. Educational exclusion, I will not give you the details, but it's simply some ratios of those who are at the bottom, but those who are at the top of educational distribution relative to those who are at the bottom of educational distribution. That ratio, will give you an indicator of inequality. How people who are at the bottom will feel relative to those who are at the top of educational distribution. And uh, health, I looked at out-of-pocket expenditure, and I looked at those who have been pushed to poverty because of out-of-pocket expenditure. I put them together. This is important because look at South Africa, for example. Your whole fortune can collapse because of sickness if you are not covered by medical insurance. That is why out-of-pocket expenditure becomes important. So health exclusion becomes an important dimension of whether people will support the state and uh, uh, believe in the state or not. Uh, this, uh, the third is economic exclusion and mainly ex exclusion from economic opportunities in the labor market. I use certain indicators for that. And uh, the fourth, is social and infrastructure exclusion. And for social infrastructure exclusion, I looked at refugee population by country of, uh, or territory of origin. 
I looked at uh, percentage of urban population practicing open defic defecation. That is lack of san sanitary infrastructure. I look at um, uh, percentage with no access to electricity, with no access to clean fuel and technology for cooking. And I looked at population with no drinking water services. This I put them taught as social and infrastructure exclusion. And I have certain um, uh, literature that corroborates that these factors that I'm putting in have been proven to be important in these dimensions. Then I looked at absolute exclusion, which are sets of absolute poverty put together. And all of these exclusions, I put them in, um, I put them all in, um, I use a principal component analysis, technique of reduction of dimensionality to bring up indices that I then use for uh, the analysis. So these are the indicators I put that together, but other indicators that I use which should complement the model is uh, trade openness and natural resource reliance because these have been found in literature to be significant. So all of that are put together and uh, I'll first start by showing you how uh, they are related, the correlation of those two, uh, the two uh, state uh, fragility and uh, ec economic exclusion. So these are the correlations. Uh, you can see how strongly correlated they are. All the dimensions that I've indicated to you are strongly correlated with state fragility. That is, the more excluded uh, people are in all those dimensions, uh, the more the state becomes fragile and fragility is step to failure. I looked at legitimacy there, that, that is, uh, uh, sorry, that is, uh, correlates with uh, um, legitimacy. The previous was effectiveness and the other was overall. It's the same. Yeah, this is um, effectiveness. So le legitimacy, effectiveness. So the first thing we establish here is that there is a strong correlation, positive correlation between exclusion and state fragility. Therefore, exclusion can lead to state failure. The question is, what causes what? I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but in the analysis that I do, I did a robustness check so that I looked at, um, I control for causality issues, but I realized that the results are similar. But I chose to present the results of, uh, that I'm presenting now because uh, this is count data, state fragility measures uh, in terms of count data, and therefore I uh, would rely on models that work on count data better. So I use what is called negative binomial regression, and then uh, accounting for zero truncation, and then I came to uh, some results. And I'm going to skip everything to take you to what I found. So these are the key results. What you see there shows that education is at the top. So educational exclusion in most cases will have ranging effects ranging from 19% to 24% uh, in, in terms of facilitating state fragility, which will lead to state failure. This means that if uh, citizens are excluded on educational grounds, there is a higher likelihood that the state will ultimately fail. The second is youth. And we know the, 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 the power of the youth and a, a number of voices have come up to give a warning because African population is marginalized but it's majority youth and that is why when there are issues in African countries, we should be very careful because we are dealing with uh, youths who are very angry. Then we have gender as well, and I'll say why I think gender is also that significant. Then economic, absolute poverty, social infrastructure, and health. So we see that education tops the list, and it's not surprising, and I would explain uh, uh, later what are the implications of the results. 
The first thing in general is that the results show that economic exclusion has a bigger and significant effect on state fragility and ultimately state failure, that is also economic exclusion, compared to levels of income. And that is why later I argue that if countries are only focusing on economic growth policies and they don't think about inequality, they are doing what is going to be in the long run counterproductive. Because then, because you hear a lot of talk about economic growth. If we take the example of South Africa, the post-apartheid economic growth in South Africa from 2000 till the period of the uh, global crisis, 2007-2008, was robust, but it highly reduced poverty. The recently published uh, 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 poverty figures that Statistics South Africa produced in uh, 2019 are largely based on the growth of that period. And we are sitting with poverty of more than 50% headcount in South Africa. That tells you that the growth that has happened in South Africa has been largely less poverty reducing. So it's not pro poor. So we should do something more than promoting growth in an era when exclusion is rife. So um, talking about educational exclusion being the biggest threat, that's not surprising because the inequality that we experience in the world has been caused more by skis, bias, technical change. Technology is not a, a, a factor neutral. But in economics, usually in economics, when things are getting a bit difficult, we like to suit it with assumptions so that they can go smoothly. But those assumptions can be, become very dangerous because when you talk about uh, factor neutral uh, technology, we are entering into the era of fourth industrial revolution. And if we do not accept that technology is not factor neutral, we might enter into trouble. We have to accept that skill bias technical change is important and it is causing inequality so that we can actively develop policies to gauge against the inequality effects of um, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. My colleague, Professor um, Kevin Boalia presented and I was quite fascinated as I was following uh, that um, he is working on all of these things, e-government. And when I listened, I was asking myself, where will the poor be by the time we enter into the fourth industrial revolution? It will be worse. So these things I'm talking about are going to get worse with the fourth industrial revolution if nothing is done. And uh, we can talk about fourth industrial revolution, but most countries will collapse because of unequal distribution of income and exclusion. Now that graph there, the only few con uh, say, uh, regions in the world that have managed to reduce inequality in recent time is Latin America. You will find that um, Latin American inequality was as high as that of Africa. But from um, about 2000 going to 2010, they managed to reduce it. What did they do? Research shows that education, equalization of access to education to a higher level in order to reverse skills premium by increasing the availability of skills level supply so that through the demand and supply, the wages of skill will go down and the wages of low skill will go up as more skilled uh, laborers come in. For example, if doctors are too expensive, you produce more doctors. Then if there are so many doctors, then they will have to ask for less money because they have less patients to treat since th there's competition. And basically that is the idea behind it, that the more skill you put in the economy, the more you correct the economy. Which means that reduction of inequality is not going to be sustainably done through cash handouts for a long time, like social grants. We can do that in terms of shock like this. But that's not the way to go. It should be very concerning when children get out and they are demonstrating and asking for education. And we are acting so harshly towards them because they are doing something that will help us in the future. And we need to look into it more carefully and ask ourselves, what should we do? Because although later on, I don't know what went wrong, but inequality began to rise again in Latin America. But they brought it down because usually, I'm going to show you also at some point, that um, uh, the countries 
especially countries in fragile situation and failing countries usually prefer not social spending but military spending. I'll show you that. So I've looked at gender. Uh, there's much to talk about gender, the role of gender in uh, gender level force participation in fertility choices. We know that um, uh, poor people are more fertile. Poor people tend to have more children than non-poor people. And the question is why, the, this research is not about why poor people have more children than uh, non-poor people, but that's a fact. So population growth is an issue. But I'm not going to go into the moral debate of how do we address population growth, but it's something that we should think about. It's something, because poor people are contributing more to population growth. But population growth is a good thing if the labor force that is coming has uh, the economic structure to absorb them and make them productive. But if it is only perpetuating more poverty, then it is, it, there's an ill there that must be addressed. And I, I'm not saying how we should address it at this time. I'm merely pointing out that uh, that is an important thing to look at. Uh, but women, um, labor force participation has been associated with less fertility. Uh, women who are working will have less children because uh, the opportunity cost of having more children is higher compared to what they earn as they work. Then uh, women's socioeconomic status uh, have been associated to with human capital development of the next generation in terms of health and education. Uh, one, one of my students and myself, we have a publication on that. And gender inequality also penalizes economic growth in the long term. Uh, that is, a number of uh, colleagues have had more on that. And more than, uh, uh, directly, women leadership have been associated with um, uh, uh, more development than otherwise. And women also get involved in armed conflicts as well. Then uh, we have uh, exclusion from socioeconomic opportunities. That is a given. A number of research have come up with the linkage between economic opportunities and satisfaction. And I began by saying the role that satisfaction plays in state building and the distribution of that satisfaction. Now infrastructure, uh, Thorbecker uh, uh, and Howard uh, had highlighted the role of infrastructure in uh, uh, poverty reduction, proper infrastructure. In most African countries, uh, we have a lot to show about good roads and airports, we, we, we like to talk in those terms. But I asked the question, how many poor people really go to the airport? What is the connection between poverty and airport? There's hardly any connection. The airports are there to ship leaders abroad and bring them back and maybe import some things. Seaports are also there. But what you find amazing, uh, quite disturbingly lacking in most African countries and most developing countries is farm to market roads. Most poor people are actually trapped with lack of infrastructure. And therefore, we have to look at proper infrastructure. Uh, we talked about uh, 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 the, 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 the indicators that are used here are based on certain infrastructure. Then, health exclusion. Also, all these variables were significant in uh, reducing state resilience, and they were, sig uh, they were significant, uh, majority were significant across all the dimensions, legitimacy and, um, and um, effectiveness. But also I had to go a little bit lower into key performance areas of the state, uh, security performance, political performance, economic performance, and social performance, and all of that are found significance, particularly with education and others, that I will not go into details now. But um, the presentation, the, 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 the full um, paper have those details. So the question is, do developing countries and fragile states understand this? Do they understand that social investment in, uh, in the social dimensions of livelihood and uh, particularly human capital of the excluded is the most important thing for long-term sustainable development? The answer is, I don't think so. Because this graph that I'm showing you is a graph that compares um, fragile regions to non-fragile regions. The one up 
is the share of military spending to social spending. You realize that most fragile countries who are generally poorer take the poor resources that they have and they put in military spending at the expense of social spending. Whereas countries that are stable, their share of military spending relative to social spending is that low, which means that they, they spend more on the social aspects of, of uh, development. So uh, that tells us what happens in most of these fragile nations. Whenever citizens get up to demand for rights, they use military might to, to, to put them down. Because when the state is becoming illegitimate, it has to use more force. And the more illegitimate the state is, the more force it will use until it quiets the citizens or destroys the nation. And this is what we've observed in so many developing countries, particularly of Africa. I'm wondering if I should name a few, we can, but we know which countries we are talking about here. I work with some of their governments as well. So um, basically then, the, the concluding remark that I have for concerning this presentation is that uh, if policies are not really focusing on um, economic growth without regards to distribution outcomes, that will be counterproductive. Yes, uh, there is uh, a guy, uh, two gentlemen, Dollar and Cray, in 2002, they published a paper that growth is good for the poor. And that is true. Without economic growth, you cannot reduce poverty. But we have thought when we read papers like that, that redistribution may not matter. But in the long run, redistribution is the main thing. Because that growth itself will depend on redistribution. No matter how much you invest in infrastructure, in productive infrastructure, it can be burned down in a few weeks by disgruntled citizens, and you get back to square one. So when we talk about, the, the, I was called at some point to, um, I was talking to the, engin, um, the CIFSA, the meta engineering uh, sector, and that I was telling them as a private sector that they shouldn't think that inequality reduction is only something that government must do and they only get their profit and put in their pockets. No. Because when the xenophobic attacks, I call it xenophobic attack in quotes, because I have a number of publications on it that I would uh, say that um, the way it happened and my analysis of the link to distribution at the lower tail of the wealth, uh, income distribution spectrum suggests that it is fighting for limited resources at the lower end of the distribution that is packing that. And that can happen in any country, not only in South Africa. And indeed, it has happened in many African countries where limited resources are being fought, usually when poor people cluster together. And when you come from another country, you are running from war on the development in your country, you come to another country like South Africa, you, you, your level of income is not as high as uh, allowing you to live in Santon. You're obviously going to live in a poorer neighborhood and you're going to do similar things that the poorer people do and clashes will come there the same way that in olden days cattle rearers have been fighting for grazing land because it, it was limited resources. It's exactly the same thing. And if we label it xenophobic attack, we might forget where it's coming from and where it's going to. And therefore we have to think again how to solve these things, which is a collective intergovernmental effort. So um, the most important thing is not economic growth is important, but I think that we are reaching a level where inequality and economic exclusion is becoming much more important because it is uh, actually threatening the existence of the state. And if the state is not effective, then there's no national space for economic growth to take place, for production to take place. And therefore, we will be all be gone. So in the beginning, I began by talking about um, the uh, economic, uh, I mean, the, the economic thinking. And the world has been paying attention much more on other threats. We talk a lot about climate change for the right reason, and we talk about tipping points. And there is a lot of money now going to interplanetary defense because aster asteroids are flying and there's uh, some chance that it will hit some part of the world and kill people. And so they are taking precaution. 
But the one thing they are not taking precaution against is the power, the destructive power of a marginalized population. So I'm going to end my lecture here. There's much to discuss about, and these are exciting things. And my objective was to provoke debate on these things, and we start to think more seriously on in important issues of inequality and economic exclusion, how it affects our society, and what kind of policies we should put on the table in order to build stable states. So I uh, thank you all, and I thank everyone who is listening online. God bless you all. Uh, in in Professor Nepa's uh, documentation, he said he says he came to understand that to be impactful, he had to climb the academic ladder higher. So, with assistance from the African Economic, Economic Research Consortium, he found himself at the University of Cape Town, where he completed his PhD in 2010. Uh, that's a very kind statement. Um, it's 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 a privilege tonight to record the fact that. It was a real struggle for Professor Ngepa to get to do this, to fund this. He, he battled, he experienced great hardship. He experienced the inequalities in our country. And so it's, it's a celebration for me this evening, because this evening is a real celebration of a very long run process. And it's a, it's a pleasure to honor uh, Professor Ngepa for his fortitude and his commitment in the journey and just to tell him that he is a real inspiration. Um, he goes on to say that he joined the University of Johannesburg as a visiting senior fellow in 2011. The courtship worked so well that he moved in full time in 2016 as an associate professor. Well, that is very uh, odd language for a minister. Um, I presume that, the, that that was an official post, uh, a true wedding. Um, and uh, but still, the point I'm trying to make here: he, uh, the, tonight we're witnessing his promotion to full professor. He has so clearly flourished uh, in the University of Johannesburg with his colleagues. He he he's on a mission. He brings his research. We've heard it tonight. Uh, he's worked in government, civil society, uh, elsewhere. The, this is the environment within which he's flourished. And so I, I celebrate this amazing union uh, tonight. Um, and, I, you know, with his students, he's clearly a wonderful supervisor, super productive researcher. And with, your, with you, his colleagues as well, uh, th thank you for uh, creating an environment in which uh, the Professor Ngepa could become what, what, he, what he has become. Uh, so he addressed the theme of socioeconomic exclusions and state failures, a prospect theoretical perspective. Uh, embodied in his paper is his substantial body of work on the determinants of growth. That's a very technical work that mercifully was understated in his address this evening. Um, and also embodied then is in more, his more recent work looking at the relationship between growth and inequality which is harder. It's not, it's not a technical, easy exercise. And we've seen that tonight. Uh, it, one has to confront conceptual issues, uh, but issues that are of crucial importance to this continent about the relationship between growth and poverty and inequality, the triangle, if, if you like. Uh, many people speak of the African growth miracle but the attention of the address this evening, uh, the address this evening brings to our attention the fact that poverty reduction has not followed uh, the expansion of growth in the continent. And inequality is the key that sits at the center of understanding why that is the case. And so the paper builds off that. It builds off that body of work that, that Nicholas has been involved in for a long time. Uh, he mentions that one of the major channels that inequality hinders growth is political instability. And that takes him then to, uh, to the topic of, of, um, of state fragility and state failure and the link between inequality and that. And as, as uh, is mentioned, 
there's not a well-developed framework for assessing this link. It's not, there's no plug and play. Yeah. And what we are seeing tonight in, in this paper is, uh, is a thinking exercise, a conceptual, a truly scholarly exercise of trying to think through this framework in a way that allows uh, to do quantitative work. But preceding the quantitative work is this thinking. And that's what makes this a, a, a special um, inaugural. And uh, Professor Ngepa draws on prospect theory, which has, and it's a very clever idea. It, it really is a clever idea. Why? Why is it so clever? Because the core of prospect theory says that losers uh, overreact relative to winners in a situation. So in a society, even if you have an equal income gain for winners to the income loss for losers, the society is going to experience net social loss. That's at the heart of this theory of, of uh, Professor Ngepa. And, and it, 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 it advances our understanding in the continent of what we, what's called polarization, where we're getting a splitting of the income distribution, a widening of inequality, a splitting of the income distribution. And, uh, and it's a real contribution. And um, the professor goes on then to, to, to build the analysis of the links between a growth and inequality or uh, exclusion as it is here and um, to st state fragility and state failure. There's lots of scholarship in this, in this paper, uh, some of which is about the scholarship of, of actually deriving variables that measure what you want them to measure. I, don't, I know that's not going to be very interesting to you, um, but the measure, for example, of state uh, fragility we, uh, out pops a measure from, from scholarly work by, by Professor Ngepa of uh, five, five measures, uh, a five-point scale of fragile states, of which uh, scale number four and five are failed states. So you get a continuum here that combines the literature on, uh, on, on fragility in general with state failure. And it's very creative. It reminds me of a very famous development economic, economist called Danny Roderick, who's on the state president's economic advisory uh, panel. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a, that, that is an accolade to uh, Professor Ngepa. Um, he, uh, he goes on to review the, the, the literature, the descriptive and econometric approaches to, to uh, f determinants of fragility, the review makes me a little queasy. It's classic, um, uh, not good enough African scholarship to be useful. And it makes Professor Ngepa queasy too. There's a whole long section then where he tries to found that literature more sensibly on the levels of income, the changes of income, that's growth, inequality. Uh, and, and that then allows him to, to, to use his measure, social exclusion measures that he derives. He, spe he spoke a lot at the end about the, the impacts of youth and education. Those all pop out of carefully derived measures. And that all, all of those go in then to him doing the modeling that he does. Uh, and he does it very well. And as I said before, thank heavens he spares us the detail. Um, and, and then he comes to his findings. So is the effort worth it? Well, so what does he find? The results validate the predictions of the prospect theory framework in the sense that both the real income levels, there's no denying the fact that your levels of income are important, but your inequality, your social exclusion is at least as important, probably more important. It took a lot of craft to derive those findings in a believable sense. Uh, and they're very important policy implications that flow that the professor actually spoke about right at the end. But particularly, policies narrowly focused on economic growth without regard to distributional outcomes will be counterproductive because they'll unwind because the foundations of growth is an inclusive society. Uh, a crucial finding um, for our country just think about our country. Think about the country you're going to drive home to this evening um, and, and think about the value of this paper uh, that Professor Ngepa has brought to you.
So I think it's a it's an inaugural lecture, a perfect inaugural lecture in a sense, and is and and in and of itself makes a contribution. Um, it's it's perfect inaugural lecture. It's not perfect uh, theory though because it's not finished. Uh, the, this idea of prospect theory is a clever idea. It's just a start. It's underdeveloped. It's the beginning, not the end. Uh, it's, it's, there's much crucial theoretical and quantitative work to do in the interests of our continent. And it's work that's worthy of a professor. It's work that's appropriate that the professor has tabled it, but yet to push it far enough. So uh, that's where I'd like to end. It's a wonderful uh, future journey for uh, one of our most talented and committed professors. Thank you very much. Professor Lebrand, thank you very much for that very rich and kind response. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to call upon Professor Van Lel to come and perform the robing of Professor Ngepa. Friends, um, family, colleagues, um, please join me in congratulating Professor Gepa on, on a very... We can all, all agree on the, the power of his lecture and indeed the fact that it is extremely thought and debate provoking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like on behalf of the University of Johannesburg to congratulate him on this momentous occasion and to wish you the best in your career going forward. And um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the conclusion of our proceedings for this evening. And I would like to thank you for your participation um, and wish you a good evening. Um, Diabulela, good evening, and Khuyenang. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.